While Splatoon has been inking the streets for a few years now, it still feels fresh among Nintendo's stable of timeless worlds. Taking a different approach to online shooters has allowed the publisher to attract a broad audience of fans, resonating with players who often avoid or feel intimidated by the genre. Splatoon 3 picks up right where the second game's momentum left off. There are tweaks and improvements throughout, but for better or worse, it doesn't do much to alter the formula fans already adore. With single-player, multiplayer, co-op, and more, Splatoon 3 has a lot going on, and connecting it all is the central plaza. Different buildings lead to various multiplayer lobbies, a suspicious drain takes you to the single-player adventure, and shops for weapons, outfits, and knickknacks line the streets as recognizable physical locations. There are also a few more features here, such as a super handy recon tour that lets you explore maps without getting shot at, and an all-new deck-building tabletop game that makes for a great way to get your fix even when you're offline. Inside some of the buildings are target ranges to test out different combinations of weapons and gear, and these are also available while matchmaking, so you're not left staring at a countdown. The plaza is a great place to get a feel for this world and fellow players. Messages drawn by the community appear above their avatars, as well as being posted as graffiti throughout the alleyways. Perhaps the most distracting issue with the main plaza is simply that it all runs at a noticeably lower frame rate than the game's other modes, so it can be jarring whenever you walk outside after a few matches. Another downside to this approach is that some features are easy to miss, such as the new locker room, which at first just looks like a blank wall between the multiplayer menu and a vending machine. Thankfully though, if you're not in the mood for hiking around town, you can also quickly navigate between most of these spots from the menu as well. The single player campaign is both familiar and expands on Splatoon lore in surprising ways. After a few intro levels to moisten your tentacles, you find your way deep underground to a research station known as Alterna. The base's snowy terrain and artificial sky serve as a hub connecting scores of levels as you try to clear infectious fuzzy slime from a series of islands. In Splatoon fashion, a series of kettles dotting the islands serve as entryways to individual levels, and you have freedom to tackle them however you choose. By using power eggs, primarily earned from completing levels, you can clear the puddles of goo blocking your path. As long as you have enough eggs, you can move on, so you can skip stages or come back later if you like. However, finishing levels also unscrambles bits of truly juicy Splatoon backstory, so there's strong incentive to tackle every level to read it all. While Alterna feels like a believable part of the Splatoon world, the individual levels still feel mostly like abstract challenge courses with floating platforms that are more about mechanical design than fleshing out spaces to explore. There's nothing wrong with the approach, but every now and then, moments like the game's intro out in the Splatlands tease a much broader world that's just begging to be explored. That said, what's here is very well done. Most levels offer a couple sets of weapons to choose from, which allows you to not only get accustomed to basic abilities, but really does a good job of introducing you to the game's wide arsenal. This is especially key for making the most use of the new bow-type weapons, as well as specials like the Zipcaster, which allows you to dash to distant walls like a ninja frog. There are quite a few platforming devices distinct to Splatoon's shooting and swimming mechanics, such as diving into ink rails to cross gaps, or using gushing geysers to reach higher ground. There are also plenty of familiar challenges like hiding behind cover and using explosives to splat whole groups of enemies. Most levels take less than five minutes as you hop rides on blimps, dodge snipers, and knock out targets. In fact, several of the most difficult levels are straight up target practice as you have to hit blocks flying overhead or pop balloons while grinding on rails with little room for error. There are also a handful of fun boss reveals, including a showdown with the giant shark. However, while they make for great set pieces, most of these fights are pretty simple and straightforward. Only the epic final boss sequence really feels like it pushes you with interesting and challenging mechanics. In terms of multiplayer, Splatoon 3 sticks with the same set of modes as its predecessor. The classic Turf War design is still a fantastic way to let players of any skill level contribute as two teams of four compete to ink the map in their team's colors. 
The fundamentals just have such a different foundation from other games as you paint little corners other players might miss, make sure to ink your base as fully as possible, and look for opportunities to be sneaky and tag your opponent's base while others fight over the center. Kills help by keeping enemies off the map while they wait to respawn, but a good kill streak means nothing if you aren't diligently painting territory. The so-called Anarchy modes include Splat Zones, Tower Control, Rainmaker, and Clam Blitz, each one essentially pushing both teams to the same locations for more intense offensive and defensive games. There are so many times when you feel a match is under control only for the opposing team to rally and push through your defenses, or vice versa. Trying to determine when to focus on the objective and when to stop other players leads to lots of strategic experimentation. Sometimes you might want to hang back and support another player riding the tower. Other times you might win by grabbing the Rainmaker and making a desperate run for it. And each of these modes presents different advantages and disadvantages for the weapons you choose to bring into them. Speaking of weapons, the variety on hand is one of Splatoon's greatest strengths. From new weapon types such as bows and splatanas to standby favorites like the arrow spray and sloshers. While you may not be comfortable with every weapon right away, a little more practice, a different mode, or a different map can open things up. There are so many things that play completely differently from each other, whether it's a roller that excels in covering ground, a splatling to net quick kills, or a blob lobber with bouncing projectiles that can throw opponents off their game. In terms of getting new weapons though, Nintendo has definitely slowed the pace of their rollout. Rather than using coins to buy weapons, you need tickets, which are rewarded more sparingly as you finish matches and level up. Thankfully, the shop lets you try before you buy, so you won't have to spend a ticket just to find out a weapon's not a good match. Gear is important too. Hats, shirts, and shoes all have varied perks, such as increasing walking speed or reducing how much ink is consumed when you throw a sub-weapon. The better the gear, the more perks it might have, most of which only unlock after playing a few rounds to level them up. If you really want to dig in, there are also a lot of systems to customize and amplify those perks to stack them to your advantage. Outside of competitive matches, there's also the co-op horde mode Salmon Run. The biggest change here is that you never have to worry about the on-again, off-again schedule like in Splatoon 2. In every Salmon Run match, you have to fight off hordes of enemies, knock out bosses, and deliver eggs to a central basket. All of that sounds simple at first, but each wave can bring unpredictable variations. The tide might rise, giving you limited space to work with, or glowflies might latch onto a player, making them a target for the swarm. After you rank up a bit, it gets nuts, with multiple bosses appearing in quick succession, making it tough to keep the team alive. Every once in a while, a kaiju-sized Kohozuna enters the fray, surrounded by a school of regular bosses. You don't get to pick your weapons in Salmon Run either, so it truly puts your skills and coordination with other players to the test. The last mode, so to speak, comes with Splatfests, limited events that pop up every few months, lasting over the course of a weekend. The whole plaza becomes a big party with the singers from Deep Cut performing in the streets, and you choose a team to join for the duration of the event. Unlike the previous two games, there are now three teams instead of two, which leads to the newest and perhaps most troubled aspect of Splatoon 3, which is Tricolor Turf Wars. These matches start halfway through the weekend, pitting one team of four players versus two teams of two. While perspectives on how this balances out have varied, even getting into a tricolor battle can be a challenge, as it seems that Nintendo hasn't quite figured out the matchmaking yet. Even if you queue up for a tricolor match, chances are you'll face off in a regular turf war instead. Apparently, Nintendo felt they were too frequent during the pre launch demo event, but in the one Splatfest we've seen since, some players barely even got to play any tricolor matches, despite hours of attempts. Hopefully Nintendo will get things sorted out soon so Splatfests continue to be something to look forward to. In terms of presentations, Splatoon 3's visual design is superb, with subtle reflection effects and fun environmental details on maps such as Wahoo World, where you can see characters on roller coasters and cafes in the backgrounds. Most importantly, it's the language of its audio and visual design that shines through, creating strong feedback for when you've landed a hit or when you're in trouble. The music also stands out with squiddy vocals that can't be mistaken for anything else. 
mixed inspirations from funky grinds in the shops to frantic pianos and guitars during matches are a delight. And likewise, the tunes do so much to keep you motivated and coming back for more. It's just a shame there isn't a jukebox somewhere to easily browse the full catalog of songs. Splatoon 3 continues the winning combo that Nintendo's landed on with this series, and remains as fast-paced and addictive as ever. Aside from some work needed to make Splatfests less frustrating, the bigger issue is that it follows in its predecessor's footsteps perhaps a bit too closely. Whether you're a veteran or a newcomer though, Splatoon's unique gameplay style, strong design, and wide variety of weapons do so much to get you invested, and coming back for more. Final score, 8.5 out of 10. Thanks for watching our review. We're Easy Allies. We've been writing about games for decades, and we also do podcasts, streams, shows, and more, all funded by generous viewers just like you. Head to patreon.com slash easy allies to pitch in and get rewards. And be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay connected on YouTube. See you soon.